that we so we can continue with uh, in real locale talking about mega thrust events from 2004 to 2011, how we change our outlook. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, go back to this computer. And let me start before I know you're you're anxious to go to lunch, so let me let me start before we start is kind enough to uh, bring up the, the slides here. Um, we've had two really major mega thrust events, 2004 in Sumatra, 2011 in Tohoku, and we've had a few in between which, uh, which are still quite uh, respectable, like in Chile, 2010, uh, after a period of 40 years without really any mega earthquakes. And so uh, perhaps we, we had been sleeping uh, we had been sleeping quietly uh, and uh, persuaded that we knew the truth, that we had a model. And these events served as a pretty cold shower uh, to bring, it, bring us back to reality and change our outlook on, on things. And one such, uh, one such case was, uh, of course, the idea of a maximum expectable earthquake at any given subduction zone, which was proposed by Hiro Kanamori and Larry Ruff, who are portrayed here around 1976 when the fashion was to have long hair. And, uh, and uh, following a, a very simple idea uh, by Kanamori and Uyeda san, uh, that um, uh, it was all a question of cutting. Give me the age of a material you subduct, which therefore may be warm or cold, light or dense. Give me the rate at which you push things against each other, and I'll tell you what the maximum earthquake you can expect uh, in, a, uh, in a subduction zone. And they published this diagram, which was a very smart idea, let's face it, uh, which I taught for 25 years until 2004. I was teaching this. I was asking my students on final exams to uh, you know, reproduce this. And then the problem is that Sumatra came as a kind of cold shower because uh, it was predicted to, in, if you take the, uh, the particular age of the lithosphere there and the particular uh, rate at which it subducts, you would predict a maximum in that area of about 8.1 or so. And boom, Sumatra is anywhere, somewhere around 9.2. And um, is this the exception which confirms the rule? It's a bit embarrassing. Uh, and so uh, we have to, to address the question, how do we fit Sumatra in that paradigm? And this is something Seth Stein and myself embarked on. And we said, well, you know, in 25 years, we've got much better data. We've got better rates. We've got better ages. So perhaps we can reconcile it somewhat. And we started moving the points on the diagram. The problem with this is that when you move the points on the diagram, we go, uh, you, you make it worse. You don't make it better. Uh, so uh, as you see, for example, there are some of these, these blue points which, um, which represent areas such as the New Hebrides where you don't see any major earthquakes, they suddenly move up with the new data showing increased uh, spring, um, convergence rates where they move up to the area where you should have magnitude 9 in the New Hebrides, which we have never heard about. Uh, another aspect is that we've, we've revised the size of historical earthquakes upwards or downwards through uh, various studies. And also we have discovered new uh, areas of subduction since 1980. And one of them being the, um, the Cascadia area of 1700. And, and unfortunately and embarrassingly, they plot at the wrong, at the wrong place. So after doing all of this, um, this is a reinterpretation from a paper by Seth Stein and myself. You go from a, a correlation justifying the, the Ruff and Kanamori model uh, in 1980 of about 80%, which is good. You can publish a correlation of 80%. The reviewers will, will let you do this. You go to a correlation of 35%, where essentially, if we were to review that today, we would say, no, it doesn't work. So in other words, uh, this was bad enough. But then in 2011, the Tohoku earthquake occurs, and it's plots somewhere in the upper left corner of there. Uh, with a magnitude of perhaps 8.9 or 9.0, when again it was predicted to be 8.2. So that's a second exception which uh, disproves the rule, in a sense. And then you, you start looking very carefully at, uh, at Ruff and Kanamori, and you see that they had already, um, you know, essentially pushed under the rug a few um, embarrassing events, such as Alaska or Kamchatka. Uh, if you look carefully at their diagram, they point, they, they plot, I think. Uh, I can shot this work somewhere here, I don't know. 
this is too involved for me, but uh, Kamchatka plots also in this band at about 8.2, 8.3, and we know that there was magnitude 9 earthquake in 1952 there. And then there are other examples, uh, the Aleutians and so on, so all this, all this band of 8.2, 8.3 predicted earthquakes uh, is, is up for analysis, and we can look at Tonga, which plots there. And it turns out that in 1865 in Tonga, there was a tsunami which was recorded in the Marquesas Island, and I wrote a paper which proves that it has to be bigger than that. And then you could ask questions about the Curials, and, and perhaps also about, about Ryukyu. Uh, so uh, again, uh, we need a better mousetrap, in a sense. We, we, we have to essentially strike out the Ravafa Kanamori model, can we find something better? And among many things that, that we tried, I decided that perhaps to do away with the rate of convergence and look only at age. And then there is an antique water which is, uh, which is, very, um, which is um, very appealing there. And you would be tempted to say that there is an antique water which says that old lithosphere I cannot support mega earthquakes. This is what, what is said by, by this diagram here. And one day I was with uh, Kostas Sinrakis drinking ouzo on a beach in Greece, and I said, Kostas, you need to find me a Greek name for that. And he came up with lithopasis, which means essentially lithopause. But at some age, the lithosphere uh, has no means of, of creation, of, of procreation of large, large earthquakes. And what was remarkable is that this age, which is about 85 million years, corresponded also to the failure of the, um, of the half-space thermal cooling model. And so I was, I was very optimistic that, that I was on the track with something when the Tohoku earthquake occurs. And here goes the little, the little pose, in a sense. And, and so this model also doesn't work anymore. Now, Larry Roth uh, came up also in 1985 with an idea that sediments perhaps not in, in the way that we've just heard about, but that sediments could play a role, and that you would have large earthquakes only where you had very heavy sedimentation, like more than 1,000 meters at the trunk. And the idea was that it, the sediments constituted a kind of glue to, to provoke locking for, uh, to build up uh, the, uh, the stress to the level of a very large earthquake. And it looks good, doesn't it, really? And this was picked up by, by Dave Shaw, uh, who's pictured there, and um, I uh, pointed out to him that there is this point in Kamchatka there, which, uh, sought to be, which, which uh, seems to violate the model. And they said, well, you know, that's the exception which confirms the rule. And uh, just leave Kamchatka out. I mean, it's a troublemaker. And the rest is pretty good. Yeah. Well, the rest is pretty good, um, except uh, if you look carefully, uh, the data from which it's based is subject to some, uh, to some qualification. Look at South Peru, for example. Uh, there was an earthquake in 1868 which predates any, any seismic measurement, but uh, from the standpoint of its tsunami, we know that this earthquake has to be somewhere around 9.2. And yet, there are no sediments in southern Peru uh, to speak of because it hasn't rained there in 10,000 years, so um, essentially there are no ri rivers to deliver any sediments there. So here is a point which should be moved on the diagram towards Kamchatka, right? And you can do the same thing with northern Chile where the reference earthquake is 1922, because we have a thermal magnitude on, on this one. But we know that the 1877 was bigger. So ignoring the 1877 uh, is, leads to a, a, an underestimation of a maximum earthquake in, in northern Chile. So we've got to move the northern Chile point again to the, to the right. Uh, and then the 2011 Tohoku earthquake also moves, is moved to the right. So now you have four points which violate the rule. Uh, which are exceptions which, which confirm the rule, rather. And, um, and then at this point, uh, Dave Shaw sent me a very, very gracious email, and he said, yeah, I admit it, that does not work. So, other ideas, please. And then, I mean, uh, we, need to find, we need to find perhaps a way of saying these subduction zones will um, generate mega earthquakes, and both subduction zones will not. But all of the parameters of the simple parameters, you know, make the model as simple as possible, uh, Einstein, um, uh, all these parameters which look simple, they don't work. So um, we need to find something better. In the meantime, we should be, we should be very cautious, and we should have a precautionary uh, attitude of saying that all long subduction zones uh, could be potentially megagenic. And this is the conclusion of some of the papers Seth and I have written, and also at the same time Rob McCaffrey has essentially come up with a, 
uh, with, the same, uh, with the same conclusion. So we've suddenly, we've changed our outlook, we've suddenly become humbler, because we know what we don't know. And perhaps we've become wiser in this respect. Um, and perhaps knowing what we don't know means that we know more than we thought. Uh, this has become a, a, a matter of semantics at this point. So there's another casualty of Tohoku, perhaps, uh, which are se seismic scaling laws. That's another thing I've been teaching for years and writing papers based on scaling laws. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not alone in this respect. All the people who look at frequency magnitude relations, uh, um, you know, probabilistic this and that, and, and so on, they're all based on scaling laws. And what are scaling laws about? Well, essentially, they tell you uh, if you increase the size of an earthquake, you increase the length, and you increase the length predictably with respect to the seismic moment, and you increase the, the slip on the fault, and you increase the slip on the fault predictably, all of this because you have some variance in the problem. You have a rigidity of the material, which is pretty much an invariant. You have the fault shape, the aspect ratio of the fault, which at this is probably going to be on the order of 1 to 2, um, barring, uh, barring an exceptional situation. The rupture of velocities, the strain release, all of this means that all fault zones essentially are created equal. I also taught in my classes that all rocks are created equal, you know, which doesn't go well with my colleagues in petrology. Uh, but uh, for, for this purpose, the big idea behind all of this was we understand uh, a similitude between, between small and large earthquakes. And I can tell you everything about one earthquake by giving you one number, which is the seismic moment. Uh, and then we have the case of Tohoku, for which, uh, and, and perhaps we should put some reservation to this, but for which most studies, the tomographic seismic studies, some of the GPS studies, some of the tsunami studies, they, they reach a conclusion that there might be a patch there which has 50 meters of, of displacement. And this patch is, is spread over such a small area that, uh, that this leads to exceptionally large strains, which are way above, at 5 times 10 to the minus 3, they are way above this, this uh, universal uh, strain release in, a, in an earthquake. So this is in clear violation of scaling laws. And this is, as I said, confirmed by seismic, geodetic, and tsunami studies. And how did the rock manage this? Well, there are some I ideas. Rupturing in, so in softer material, you know. And you can involve, as we've, as we've heard, splay folds, which would go into, into softer material, which, which could rupture um, with, uh, with different strains, influence of landslides. Uh, my personal reservation to all of this is that to, to significantly affect the final solution, for example, the excitation of a tsunami in the far field and so on, all these deviations from the paradigm must be coherent over large distances. And this is something which I think is, is a major problem. I, I'm all in favor of, of a splay fall, a by splay fall, uh, as, as, a, as a, a kind of secondary ancillary phenomenon which occurs in, in a relatively small environment. But to have a splay fault which extends, for example, in the case of Sumatra, if you want to take the case of Sumatra, to have a splay fault which extends for 1,200 kilometers, um, I, I sort of feel uneasy about it. Uh, and at any case, this is very interesting because this, this uh, proposal of enormous uh, slips in Tohoku reopens like, a few very controversial suggestions. For example, there is an earthquake in Crete in 365 AD, where people have proposed also enormous strain rates based on, um, on the interpretation of terrace uplift and so on. And so uh, that also is a new outlook on things. And finally, uh, there is a the question of rupture slowness. One of, the, one of the problems that we face, especially in the tsunami community, um, <laughs> is that uh, we, make, uh, we make seismic observations and we uh, extrapolate them to longer periods uh, to, to uh, model the, the possible tsunami in real time. And for this, we assume a certain behavior uh, of the earthquake fault, again, scaling lows, and so on. And uh, this sometimes proves wrong, because the earthquake happens to be slow and, uh, and uh, have a, a rupture which is slower than, than uh, expected. And that was the case, remember, that was the case with Sumatra. And on this diagram, uh, frequency goes to the right, period goes to the left. And you see that the seismic moment that you measure increases uh, if you increase the period. From the CMT solution, which was deficient by factor of 4 or so, to the gravest mode, 0 is 2, that we can measure, 
and which makes the earthquake the second largest perhaps ever, ever measured. And so uh, the question is, is this, a, is this a, a common and regular feature of these, of these mega earthquakes? And the answer is no. Uh, for example, if you go to Tohoku, granted it's a bit smaller, but if you go to Tohoku, the same analysis of the Earth's own nodes um, and shows a, an absolutely flat line, and it tells, it tells you that if you measure the CMT, which is a green dot on the figure, if you measure the CMT at 300 seconds, and then you measure 0 is 2, the excitation of the, of the um, uh, greatest football mode of the Earth at 3,000 seconds, you find the same seismic moment. And so it tells you that this, this Tohoku earthquake, as bad as it was, it didn't, hit, it didn't hide anything under the rug. Uh, what it told you at 300 seconds was pretty much the, the final product at 3,000 seconds. So you start trying to make, in, to make a table, and that's not made very easy by the fact that many of these megaquakes are very old. Uh, but the Chilean earthquake is known to have had a very, very long period precursor that Hirokanamori detected in 1975. The Alaska earthquake, Meredith Nettles reworked it, uh, reworked it at 600 seconds, and she found a, a, an, an increased moment. So there may be also an element of slowness there. Sumatra qualifies. And perhaps the right island, I have some very preliminary data on it, would be also somewhat slow. On the other hand, you have the regular earthquakes, the textbook earthquakes, uh, which don't show this, this slowness, such as Chile 2010, Tohoku 2011, and the Niasa earthquake, which was the sort of Sumatra aftershock in 2005. So if you try to plot them here, uh, if you try to plot this slowness character as a function of moment, uh, you find that the super mega earthquakes, if I may say, which are Chile, uh, Sumatra, and, and probably Alaska in 64, uh, they are slow, or probably slow, and the, uh, the, 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 um, the not so mega, very big, but, but somewhat second level earthquakes such as Tohoku or uh, Chile 2010 or Nias 2005, uh, they don't seem to be slow. Interestingly enough, uh, many of those uh, have bilateral rupture. Uh, Nias and, and Maori and uh, Tohoku as well have bilateral uh, rupture, which seems to indicate that perhaps there is something there's something correlating there. But on the other hand, Unimac in 1946 also uh, has bilateral rupture and is definitely slow. Uh, I'd like to finish by saying a few, a few things about what, how we've changed our outlook regarding tsunami lessons. I mean, there have been countless talks on this, but I thought I would also incorporate some, some, um, uh, some comments on this. Uh, now, as you all know, even though a mega crash event was not expected, it had occurred in 8869, and, um, uh, um, uh, and certainly uh, we, we should bear in mind that, I mean, it's trivial to say, but that anything we do with instrumental seismology grossly underrepresents the seismic record uh, on the scale of thousands of years, which could be, in some areas, the seismic cycle. Uh, one, one of the things we should keep in mind following Tohoku is that regardless of the nature of that earthquake, giant waves, 25, 27, 29 meter waves had occurred very, uh, you know, very close in the past, in 1896 and in 1933. Now granted, they didn't occur from the same kind of earthquakes. One of them was a tsunami earthquake. The other one was a, um, a normal faulting, outer rise. Uh, granted, uh, they, they did not occur over a similarly large area of the coastline of Japan. They did not occur exactly in front of Fukushima. But uh, if you are an engineer, uh, somehow it is intriguing that this knowledge was lost uh, in, uh, in building protections uh, against Fukushima, for example. And, uh, and of course, what we've learned, which was a terrible shock, is that even a developed country such as Japan is, is at risk from catastrophic infrastructure failure. Uh, I should say two things more and before I stop. The first one is that there was a big, big difference between 2011 and 2004, as you know, is that in 2011 we lost two people uh, to uh, the tsunami in the far field. One in California, one in Indonesia. And uh, these people disregarded, um, disregarded orders of evacuation. So it's... Um, it is, you know, uh, essentially, and I regret to say, death by stupidity, in a sense. Uh, the, the other, we did a, a tremendous amount of progress, I think, of, uh, of uh, 
educating the population uh, to the fact that to what is tsunami danger between 2004 and 2011, perhaps and 2010 as well. Perhaps we were lucky, uh, and in the future it's not good, uh, but perhaps in the future we will not be so lucky. But at least in 2010 and 2011, it was remarkable that in the far field we, we lost only those two people. Uh, and then a statistic which my, my friends from Japan will certainly, um, will, will certainly confirm is that apparently 90% of the population in affected areas in Japan in 2011 survived. 20,000 people killed, that's a horrible death toll. It's 20,000 too many, but 180,000 people saved their necks. Uh, why? Because the population was educated. And so I, I, will, uh, I knew what to do and was sensitized to uh, the question of tsunami. The tsunami was too big, yes, but at least 9 out of 10 got away. And so since I'm a teacher, and the, day, and the dean pays me to, to teach students, uh, to be an educator, I'll conclude by saying education works. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I'm a teacher too. Yeah, the dean pays you the same way. To go back to the main point of your talk, that uh, mega thrust uh, will occur uh, in other places, um, with, with a large magnitude, I, I would say that in the U.S., since I'm involved in the hazard assessment, uh, we've been revising a lot of things. It started after Sumatra. A lot more work was done on Cascadia, and initially, when uh, you know early scenarios with a 9.3 Cascadia predicted 20, 25 meters, people on the west coast screamed, and now they predict 40 meters, and they see a full Cascadia rupture of 9.3. As a, as a maximum scenario. And then more recently, you know, Hawaii has been uh, mapped for tsunamis for a long time, and, but only using uh, recent historical evidence. So now they have actually considered a possible 9.3 in the Aleutian, which has not been observed. But they are redoing all the simulations and they are going to add that to the mapping because they think it could happen now. So that goes a little bit along uh, what you were saying, that it doesn't mean that because it did not happen, it could not happen. Thank you. Yeah. You can add the lesson until it is. Is there a question in the back? Yes, I, I've got a question about um, the role of like, the subduction of ocean plateaus or sea belts in terms of like affecting the, the exception to the rule. Like I'm thinking of the 64 earthquake in Alaska, for example where seismic studies indicate if there's a flat slab in Alaska and then the Yakutat plateau may be subducted down 150 kilometers up. So can you comment on that? Uh, yes and no, but there are plenty of areas where we have not uh, identified the culprit. Uh, if you take, for example, southern Peru, uh, yes, there is an Alaska ridge. Uh, probably out of uh, three of four historical events in that region, uh, we think that nearly all of them stopped and the Nazca Ridge served as a barrier. And then the 1868 definitely went over it. So, uh, and the, it's probable that the nucleation was in Arica. So uh, the nucleation was independent of, of the Nazca Ridge in that case. And, um, and then in some instances, it does go over it. In some instances, it does not. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, more generally speaking, these are also some things that we are trying to look at. I, I mean, I'm working with some colleagues at the USGS, and some things we are trying to look at is the smoothness of, of the ocean. And the smoothness of the ocean is a complex combination of, uh, of the existence of, uh, of seamounts, which itself may have something to do with age, after all, because the longer you, you've been around, the more you may have, uh, uh, you, you may have had seamounts generated on, on yourself, plus uh, sedimentation, which may cover these, these things, or hide them. So I think it's a, it's a legitimate question, but I don't see a, a definitive signal there. Yes.
So um, I have a comment on this scaling of the attempting to uh, be um, applied to earthquake sizes and recurrent stacks and everything. And they, all of them uh, are based on some sort of intuition that um, every earthquake has the same stress drop. And, and there are a lot of um, seismic exper uh, laboratory experiments uh, recently that show that uh, you can have a small beginning of rocks and that you can have very different um, stress drop uh, control space. And um, also these earthquakes, that these guide earthquakes and subduction zones may uh, escape the scaling those because they rupture multiple seconds of the So if you want to make progress on the um, prediction of these massive events, I think we need to understand that our whole segmentation and possibility of earthquakes to rupture several boundaries, cross boundaries, uh, to, uh, to go from a great earthquake to a giant earthquake. So that's more monitoring, but I, I don't think that um, that these earthquakes just simply obey and say Yes, and and on top of that, we we don't know the the whole question of segmentation. I mean, this goes back to Endo in 1975. You know, these A B C D blocks. When you start the rupture, do you know when you start the rupture? Does the mother nature know how far it will go? If it will go A, B, C, D, or just A, D, or, um, that, was, that was essentially what Ando uh, published. And uh, I, I, I agree that, that there is something we don't understand there. And that, for example, in the case of uh, these, these slow events, that the, the, the Aleutian event of 57, which is still largely unresolved, uh, is another case where um, uh, the, uh, there is a, apparently a very concentrated area which ruptured or did not rupture for another 600 kilometers over which we see aftershocks and we don't know if it ruptured or, if, or it, it did not rupture. This we don't know. Co-seismically. There are a few aftershocks there, but we don't know. <laughs> 